This is our third installment of the Prince of Tides. It's going to start on page 120. If you remember, uh, Lila and the three children had moved to Atlanta to be with Talitha, who is, of course, really their grandmother, and Papa John, the man that she remarried, even though we never know. We think she's divorced from Amos Wingo, but we don't know. And remember, Papa John had never had any children, and he was wonderful to the children, and they loved him. They hoped the war would last forever and their daddy would not come home. This is wonderful. You think about going to school the first day and how scared and frightened you are as this section starts on 120. Savannah and I entered first grade together, our mother and grandmother walking us to the bu uh, bus stop. Luke was going into the second grade and he was in charge of us. The three of us had notes pinned to our white cotton shirts. My note read, hi, I'm Tom Wingo, a first grader. If you find me and I'm lost, please call my mother Lila at the following number, BR37929. How that she will be very worried about me. Thank you, neighbor. Can you imagine going to school with that on the front of your shirt? They had new lunch boxes. They had new clothes. They were very excited because Papa John was quite wealthy. They are terrified the first day of school and that one of the nuns, it's a Catholic school, Immaculata, is very kind to them. And later on, actually, Savannah writes a poem for her. And Tom is so happy, he says he hopes the Korean War never ends. They love to hear Papa John's stories. And Papa John is in bed. He is not doing very well. We, I don't think it ever tells us whether he has cancer or what is wrong with him. And he's always playing tricks on his on the children. He's blowing uh, nickels out of his nose. But one of the unique things about Papa John is he was a shoe salesman. But what he wanted to be unique, he started raising black widow spiders. And every night, this thin, withered man took us on miraculous, improbable voyages around the globe. And one day we started asking questions. Who is Papa John really, Mama? He's Talibus, Talibus' husband. You know that. But who is he to us? Is he our grandfather? No, your grandfather Amos lives in Colleton. But Talitha's our grandma, isn't she? She's your cousin when we're up here. She doesn't want Papa John to know you're her grandchildren. But isn't she daddy's mother? Why isn't she still married to Grandpa Wingo? It's too complicated, Lila told him. Now, they ask Lila about her parents, and she tells a very large lie once again. I think to Lila, because she told so many lies, the lies became the truth to her. And she says that her parents were named Thomas and Helen Trent. She says they were very handsome people. They looked like a prince and a princess. And she says that they were killed in a fire. My mo and Tom realizes later on that his whole life with his mother has been a lie. Their house backed up, as I told you in an in a earlier um, section of this, backed up to Collinwall, where the Coca-Cola Candlers live. Everybody in Georgia knows who they are. They started Coca-Cola Company. They have a very large estate that is still to this day, as far as I know, surrounded by woods. It's a Tudor mansion. And they look one day, they're out in the yard playing. And of course, they it's really dark, deep woods, and they look out there one day, but Savannah saw him first. He was standing beside a tree covered with poison sumac, relieving himself. The largest, most powerful man I'd ever seen. He grew out of the earth like some fantastic, grotesque tree. His body was thick and colossal. His eyes blue and vacant. He had a red beard, and he stares at us with a very menacing stare. And of course, then... The children start running and they run screaming to the house and they say that there was a man in the woods and he comes to the door. What do you want, mister? My mother said, you, he said to my mother. He didn't seem cruel or imbalanced, just inhuman. What? I want you, the giant said. And of course, they ran in the house. The mother locked the back door. And they, he laughs at them and says, I'll be back. The children think that somehow they have caused this giant to come. 
And of course, later on, he is going to, uh, to harass them even after they move back to Melrose Island. And they don't understand how on earth he was able to find him. But back in those days, you had a little red flag on your mailbox. And if you raised the little flag up, it meant that you had some mail for the mailman to pick up and mail for you. And they find out that their mother had written a letter to Grandpa Amos and had put that address on there of Melrose Island, South Carolina. And the letter was not delivered until many years later. And they realize it's because this monster, this horrible, sick human being had found out from the letter where they lived. One night, they, and they had started calling this man Collinwald because he, that was where he appeared, was in the forest behind the Collinwald Candler home. One night, they looked. They had been watching the Ed Sullivan Show. All of us on my age remember the Ed Sullivan Show coming on on Sunday night. It was the, it's eight o'clock. It was the first place I ever saw the Beatles. They um, they were watching Ed Sullivan Show, and Savannah says, Colin Wald. He was standing on the porch in darkness, staring at us. His eyes were fixed on my mother, and my mother said, "Walk very slowly down the hallway and call the police, Talitha." Talitha, my mother said, "What do you want, Lila?" My mother took a step back. He smiled a hideous smile, and of course, by this time. Um, Lila tells him the police are coming. He stuck his hand and broke the pane of glass and start put it in the hole of the where the glass was to start turning the knob on the door. All of a sudden, Tom is mesmerized. Somehow I could hear Savannah and Luke screaming, but they seemed displaced and far away. My whole body lost feeling like a Novocaine gum. He undid one lock and he was trying, twisting the key in the other lock, trying to undo it. When Luke approached him, Luke, our hero, swinging a fireplace to loose, crashed the poker across the man's wrist. The man shattered in pain and withdrew his arm. for him swinging that poker poker as hard as any seven-year-old kid on earth he turned around and he saw talitha in the hall and says duck luke with the click snap of the revolver and talitha blew the door open with that revolver when she fired it he sprinted off the porch and toward the safety of the colin wall woods we heard the sound of the police coming down pots to leon and um now Tom is terrorized by this. He thinks about, he didn't do anything. He let Luke and Talitha and his mother and Savannah was screaming and he did nothing for us. The police watched our house, watched the woods every day. He did not come back for two months. And the last day, of course, that he was not supposed, that the police left, we're going to find out that he's going to come again. The woods of Collinwall became his domain, his safe hermitage, a region of inexhaustible dread in our imaginations. They um, And the children can't get him out of their minds. And so two months later, after the police have quit riding up and down the road, Tom opens his eyes. I woke and saw his face in the window staring at me. He put his finger to his lips and bade me to be silent. I heard the knife cutting through the screen like the tear of cheap silk. Then Savannah awoke and screamed. His foot broke through the window in a brutal showering of glass. Luke rolled off the bed shouting for my mother. All the children stayed in the same room. Savannah grabbed a pair of scissors and stuck them in his forearm. Then she threw a hairbrush at him. He peered into the room and he sees his, their mother come into the room. Go away, go away, she said. And Savannah threw a hairbrush at him and he starts laughing as he started coming through the window. And once again, Luke, our hero, took the next jar of black widow spiders and threw them at the wall against his head. Luke threw the next jar at Colin Wall's face. It missed and exploded against the windowsill. But when the black widow star, uh, spider started crawling on him, he disappeared. We saw his huge legs swing into the window, slowly and em emptying into our room. Luke opened four jars and emptied them on his trouser legs. Savannah ran to the bookcase and returned with another jar. My mother was screaming for, screaming for my grandmother. He was about to slide into the room when the first black widow spider apparently bit him. We never knew how many spiders bit him, but he went down the ladder and took off running. 
And of course, they are, the police checked all the hospitals, but there was never a seven foot giant with a red beard who came in with black wood of spider bites. And of course, the father comes the next weekend and they left to go back to Melrose Island. And of course, as always, Lila is going to tell the children, do not tell their father. She is afraid that somehow in his perverse way that he might think that she had something to do with their coming there. But, but you know, might, might have somehow made an inflection or f flirted with this Colin Wald. Listen to this, though. This is very important. Many years later, while going through some clippings in the Atlanta Public Library, I came upon a photograph and the following news item. Otis Miller, 31, was arrested in Austell, Georgia last night for suspicion of having raped and murdered Mrs. Bessie Furman, a local school teacher separated from her husband. I made a photograph of that story and inked a single word across it. Colin Wild. Now, of course, um, they after this ends and they're back on the island and by this time tom has been going out to eat every evening with lowenstein and you of course as a reader can figure out where this is going she has a broken marriage with her husband henry and she hates him and she he's having an affair of course with the lovely monique if you remember who was in her waiting room You've, it takes a lot of nerve for the mistress to go to the to the wife of the husband with whom she's having an affair to get therapy and of course, they start going out every night. And um, of course, she starts as Lowenstein starts asking Tom about, is he violent like Luke? He says, only one time. And he said, that was with my students one time. He said, I had this wonderful little ugly girl in my English class, had a great spirit. He says, funny as hell, but boys liked her. She had this charm, this incredible joy. He said she was wonderful. She came to school one day with her face all beaten up. He, her left eye was swollen shut. Her lip was puffed out to hear. She didn't say a word about it even when the other kids started teasing her. Her name was Sue Ellen. Her father had beaten her and her mother the night before. And Lowenstein says, what did you do? I'm not sure what I did was in the best interest of Sue Ellen and her family, but I did it. He says, I could not stand to see that. He said, when I was a young boy, after I saw my father beat my mother and with Colin Wall, I made it a point for the rest of my life to be sure that I never saw a man beat up a woman again. He said he broke down the door to the house and he went inside. He says, I heard Sue Ellen crying somewhere. I pushed her father backward and stepped into the house. She was lying on the couch. She looked up at me and I saw blood coming from her nose. She said, hi, Coach Wingo, what brings you to this neck of the woods? And this is what he did. I kicked that father all over that house. I bounced him off walls. I beat his head on the floor. Then I heard a noise. It was like coming out of a dream. The noise was Sue Ellen jumping up and down, cheering me on. The other noise was her mother screaming for me to stop. When he came to, I told him if he ever touched Sue Ellen again, I'd come back and kill him. And she says, that's the most violent thing I've ever heard, Tom. He says, she says, but Sue Ellen's dead, Lowenstein. She chose a husband just like her father, and he killed her during a domestic quarrel with a shotgun. Like so many other people, she married somebody just like her father. He, they talk about Monique and the fact that she is um, her husband's mistress. Look what Tom tells Lowenstein. I don't know if you'll understand, but when I was a little kid and my father would abuse one of us kids or go for my mother, I made a promise I would never let a man hit his wife or children again if I could do anything about it. I've stopped fathers from hitting their children in airports. I've broken up brawls between husbands and wives who were total strangers to me and beat up Sue Allen's father. But I think I'm changing. But he's never, he's never done anything violent toward his wife. Please excuse Bandit. He's checking on what's going outdoors. Now, he says, you know, when I was a little kid, I thought my mother was wonderful and I loved her so much. And he says, but I just never could believe anything she said. She tells small lies, big lies, black lies, white lies. 
When my mother cries, she could get a job as a crocodile along the river. Remember the Bible? You have the idea of crocodile tears. Tears. This is my mother. He said, you know, Lowenstein, I've been an object of pity around my family in South Carolina for a long time now. I wasn't going to tell you about my own falling apart. I was going to keep that part of the story secret. But because I want to be a new man, I'm going to tell you everything. And she says, you're a bright and beautiful woman, Lowenstein. I'm attracted to you. I haven't been attracted to anything or anybody for a very long time. And she says, neither have I, Tom. And of course, she says, Tom says, don't you know how beautiful, how smart, you intelligent you are? He says, it's been a pleasure staring at you for a couple of weeks. Now, and then we find out that Savannah has asked that Tom not come see her anymore. He goes back and thinks about his grandmother, Talitha, who is now in a nursing home. The last time he went to see her, he sat, she sat in his lap and thought Tom was a baby. She had Alzheimer's so bad and cried like a baby. He says, she wanted me to murder her so she could leave the nursing home and die. He said, and I feel so bad because when I took her to the nursing home, I told Talitha that, that we were going for a long ride in the country. I was coming back after her. And he says, the ride has never ended. Papa John Stenopoulos finally died in 1951 and Talitha buried him in Oak Lawn Cemetery, which is actually where my husband's parents are actually buried. And we find out that Talitha left and roamed the world for three years, went many different places, did many things. She spent every penny that Papa John had, came back three years later completely uh, penniless. Talitha was so beautiful and so full of life that every woman, no matter what her age, was jealous of her. But Amos takes her back like she had never been gone. My mother praised Talitha when he was with her, but when he, she, she was not with Talitha, she talked about how bad she was. Grandpa was glad to have her back. She was irresistible to men and a threat to every woman who crossed her path. Her allure was offbeat, indefinable, and original. Love, this is a wonderful quote. Love has no weapons. It has no fists. Love does not bruise, nor does it draw blood. She is so good to everybody. She has brought them all a gift. Now we're going to learn about the probably the last main character in the novel and that family character, and that is Grandpa Amos Wingo. His whole life was one long hymn of praise to the Lord. He said God had appeared to him when he was a young boy and ordered him to be a servant of the Lord for the rest of his life. And of course, sometimes he would preach. And when he did, Savannah would say, you know, God talks like a red neck. Luke and Savannah would say every time, what does God look like, Grandpa? Well, Savannah, Grandpa said, he's a right purty looking fella. There's always a lot of light on him, around him, so I can't see him too good. His features are regular. His hair's dark, and you might suspect it's kind of long, too. And I thought maybe I should ask him to cut his hair. We find out that Grandpa is a preacher and a barber. I wouldn't charge Jesus a cent. Just trim it up a little bit, shape it round the sides. He says that God appears to him on a daily basis and that he took Talitha back because she was just a gypsy. He would go from house to house carrying one suitcase filled with his clothing and his barbering tools and another one brimmed with Bibles. If you didn't want to buy a Bible, he would cut your hair. And he said that if you didn't make a payment on the Bibles that you bought, my grandfather equated that with grievous, unspeakable sin, but he would never bring himself to repossess a Bible once he had filled out the family chron chronological order in the middle of the Bible. When I was a child, people used to come door to door selling Bibles. They would also sell world book encyclopedias because people did not have the opportunity to get out and go. They did not have the internet. He sold so many Bibles. He sold more white Bibles than any other salesman in America. When he retired, the Bible company bestowed upon him a set of gold-plated hair clippers and a certificate of gratitude that legitimized a fact we'd suspected all along. Amos had sold more Bibles than anyone in the history of the company, and they gave him a Bible, and it was called the Amos Wingo, the king of the red letter Bible. And of course, my grandparents, he says, were like two mismatched children. 
We were not allowed to criticize our father or to complain about his children. And Tom says, I lived my life thinking I knew one day that my father would kill me. I learned from my mother the loyalty that loyalty was the pretty face one wore when you based your whole life on the series of egregious lies. Each year, he loved me more. He loved me so much, he'd say he loved me. In 1955, he put me on the floor three times. In 1956, he knocked me to the ground five times. He loved me so much in 1957. By 1958, he loved me so much, I cringed my way toward manhood. And he says, I prayed every day for God to destroy him. Kill him, Lord, please kill him. Whenever I killed a deer, it was my father's face beneath the rack of horns. It was my father's heart I cut out and held aloft in the trees. It was my father's body I strung up and emptied of its viscera. He says, I felt like my father was a crime against nature. But one person his father was afraid of was Talitha. He was terrified of her. We find out that... Um, Tom is very dissatisfied as we begin the next chapter, which is chapter seven of where um, Savannah is staying. He says, team my ass. There's a psychiatrist who sees her once a week, puts enough drugs in her to anesthetize the blue whale. There's a feckless resident with the red hair, the randy front line of weightlifting humorous nurses. And didn't I make a grinning activity therapist who'll encourage Savannah to make potholders? That's your team. She says, you don't know anything. And Lowenstein says, you don't understand. Savannah is still a danger to yourself. He says, the only reason she's not a danger to herself is the fact that she is um, drugged all of the time. And of course, if you think being a boy in Colleton was bad, you should have imagined being a girl. It was unimaginable. He says, how much are you getting paid, Lowenstein, to keep her that hospital to to, to, um, to, that I'm paying you? Oh, sure, I left. A psychiatrist oblivious to money's like a sumo wrestler oblivious to body fat. Now, and she says, you just are going to have to learn. I loved your sister's poetry long before I met her. Just read her poems, Tom, and read her poems and see what she thinks. He says, you must have forgotten one minor detail, Lowenstein. I'm an English teacher, a wonderful English teacher with astonishing outsized gifts for making slack-jawed southern morons fall in love with the language they were born to damage. Men and women who feel passionately. He says, only Savannah can take the language and make it so like a bird or seen like a wounded angel. Savannah taught me, she says, yes. He says, yes, I'm a feminist. He says, I trust my instincts. And he says, you started calling me Tom, like I'm your patient. And in other words, she says, you think I need to be near her, but maybe it's just because you like me. She says, I prefer to keep our relationship professional. Then she says, I want to call you coach. She, she says, and, and that's what he said. He says, I know exactly why I hate women. I was raised by a woman. Ask me the next question, Tom says, the next logical question. I hate men, I said, because I was raised by a man. And finally, she says, my name is Susan. He says, why? She says, why did you stay in the South, Tom? Why didn't you leave like Savannah did and get away from it? He says, I should have left it, but I lacked the courage. My childhood wasn't right. I thought if I stayed in the South, I could fix that childhood by making my adult life wonderful. I traveled some, but nothing was right. I could never trust a place long enough to take me in. So like an asshole, I stayed in South Carolina. It wasn't so much a failure of nerve. It was a failure of imagination. Once I dreamed I'd be a great man, Lowenstein. Now the best I can hope for is that I can fight my way back to be a mediocre man. Now, she ta he tells her, never refuse free food and liquor, Lowenstein. It's bad luck and bad taste. They go that night and eat dinner. And of course, remember that Henry had become a Catholic with uh, Father Gunter Claus when he was uh, rescued, when he was a downed pilot. And of course, they practiced definite Catholicism because Tom tells us for four straight years from 1952 to 1956, my mother was pregnant. She carried each child full term and each child was stillborn. 
We buried those sightless, wordless half-children beneath the grove of oaks, at the rear of our house, fashioning crude little wooden crosses and carving their names in the wood as my mama would weep in her bed. Our father, we would be so worried about the children. Our father would baptize them perfunctorily under the tap water in the kitchen sink, freeze them in plastic bags until my mother was well enough to return from the hospital. I had many pets as a child. I never, ever have heard of anything like this. We would go in the backyard and have a funeral. My dad would take his pocket knife and we would make a cross and he would put it together with black electrical tape and it was all very reverent. Who can imagine putting a baby in the freezer till the mama could get home from the hospital? This is Rose Astor. She wouldn't be much good in a shrimp boat anyhow. Now, of course, every year, this baby would die. He'd walk out to the back porch, place the tiny girl in a clear plastic bag, lay her on top of the boxes of frozen shrimp and fish in the freezer. And he'd tell us, here's your chance, say hi. Hi, Rose Astor. Rose Astor isn't nothing but dead meat. There she is, boys and girls. And he felt as if when he closed his eyes at night, he could hear the dead baby crying out to him from the freezer. And one night he hears Savannah screaming and crying, screaming and crying. And he goes into her bedroom. There was an anguish in her cries. And he goes in. And he, the most pathetic thing he says he's ever seen. I turned her over. And in a kind of daze or seizure of brotherly pity, I pried her arms loose from the cold, still body of Rose Astor. Let me hold her, Tom. She is going to be our sister. And no one ever stopped a minute to love her. I just wanted to talk to her for a minute. She got to know the whole world didn't like them. It's not right, Savannah. There's nothing you can tell her. Mom and Dad would beat you if they knew you took her out of the freezer. You might spoil her for when we bury her. I could tell her a lot. I told her we'd have taken good care of her. We wouldn't have let Mom and Daddy hurt her in any way. We'd have protected her. Tell her that, Tom. She needs to know that. She's the fourth one's died, Tom. That's some kind of sign from God. I think these poor little creatures are choosing not to live. They don't know that you and me and Luke are good. They just know that mom and daddy are bad. Tom says, mama says we are bad. She says it every day. She says we get worse every day. Dad says the reason she loses the babies is because we're so bad and don't give her no peace of mind. Savannah says, don't you get it? She blames everything on us. I think these little kids like Rose Astor are the lucky ones. We aren't the lucky ones. They're smarter than we were. They know that mom and dad are mean. They probably feel that their time's coming and they just probably commit suicide in mama's belly. I wish you and I had been that smart. Let me, let me, let me take Rose Astor back to the freezer, Savannah. I think it's a mortal sin to take her out of the freezer. I'm just comforting her, Tom. She'll never even got to see the world. She's in heaven now. What are the names of the other ones? I forgot. David Tucker, Robert Middleton, Ruth Francis, and now Rose Astor. We would have had a big family if they'd all lived, Savannah said. Tom tries to comfort her, but they didn't, Savannah. They're all in heaven taking good care of us. That's what Mama said. Savannah says they aren't doing a very damn good job of it. We're going to get in trouble if we don't put Rose Astor in the freezer. I slept with her all night. She's got such pretty hands and feet. Look, I thought on all night how wonderful it would be to have a little sister. Savannah says I would have killed Mom and Dad if they'd have tried to hurt her. And Tom doesn't know what to say. He says, well, Mom and Dad would have loved her like they loved us. Mom and Dad don't love us, Tom. Haven't you figured that out by now? They hate us, Tom. It's easy to see that. She held the small corpse up in her hands and kissed its little small hairless head. That's why Rose Astor is the lucky one, Tom. I was crying because I was in jail and envied her. I was jealous of her. I wish I could be with her and I wish I could be with the others. I took the pale blue body from, from uh, Savannah's arms gently and carried it to the back porch. The sun was starting to rise as I wrapped my baby sister again in plastic and laid her down once more among the fish and the shrimp. When I returned, I heard Savannah talking to herself in a voice I didn't recognize, but I didn't disturb her again. Instead, I started the fire in the stove and laid six pieces of bacon in the frying pan. It was my morning to cook breakfast, and our mother would be returning from the hospital later that afternoon. 
I have taken you page one set to 174. This will be my last installment. If book this book does not have you hooked, hooked line and sinker into this story, then I feel bad for you. There are no cliff notes. There's only the beauty of Pat Conroy's words and the flowing like a river way in which he tells them. So I hope you read the rest of it. If you don't, you will miss a very great experience. Till next time.